Hi, what I have here is an HS1000 Specs Jobin Yiban hand scan keylink terminal controller for certain models of monochromators and uh, spectrometers. Originally, I wasn't about to make this video as I wasn't expect too much to be in this controller unit. But as you can see, this unit actually has two pieces and the base module here is quite sizable. And also given that these are some highly specialized equipment that you don't typically run into every day, I thought it still might be an interesting, if not just a quick teardown. For those who don't know what a monochromator is, I strongly recommend that you check out some of my previous videos in which I used an EP200MMD monochromator to measure the spectrum of some light emitting sources, which I will include links below. And if you are curious as to how a monochromator works, I would recommend you checking out one of the signal paths videos on the EP200MMD monochromator. And you might ask what am I planning to do with this uh, controller? Well, to be honest, I think I spotted this on eBay at a very cheap price and so I grabbed it, hoping that I could find a compatible monochromator later on to work with this unit. As you know, being a hobbyist, sourcing all the equipment can be quite challenging as the cost is one of the most important factors. So a lot of the times I simply just buy parts and equipment when the prices are right and hoping that eventually I would be able to complete the systems. And uh, of course, without the monochromator and the spectrometer attached to this unit, we probably couldn't do too much with it, except to open it up and have a peek inside. And before I open it up, I just want to show you that this one actually does work to some extent. And of course, I don't know what the full functionality would be. But uh, if I power it up, hopefully you can see that we have some uh, self-testing patterns showing. And then it turns blank. According to the manual, though, it is actually supposed to be blank. So if I just press uh, this dot, you will see that we do have the boot version and uh, some other information. So presumably, we can kind of uh, punch in the numbers. Of course, I don't know what I'm doing here, but uh, we can punch in numbers and have this unit talk to the monochromator that is attached. Now, of course, we don't have the, anything attached, so I'm going to cut the chase and uh, open it up and see what we got. Now, the first interesting thing is that uh, this handheld portion is attached to this main controller unit with this RS-232 cable, as you can see here. So this is interesting because this suggests that the power actually goes through from the cable to this uh, uh, handheld portion of the unit. Now, from the RS-232 standard, we know that uh, it typically does not specify um, that power over the RS-232. So it has to be some custom uh, pin layout to pass the power in. So that's just what I'm guessing. Now, uh, just to refresh ourselves what the pins are, so I printed out a, a layout of the mail connector site. So as you can see, what we got here is the ring indicator here and the ground. And then we have the uh, terminal ready and the transmit receive pins. So which makes perfect sense as uh, I expect that uh, this does use a standard serial protocol to talk to the uh, hand unit. So the, the question right now is uh, which pin would be uh, transferring the power. So we can take a look at that. So let me just power it on and uh, grab the meter here. So the meter, let's put it here. And uh, so the case would be your ground. So let's just, uh, oops, um, I can have that stand here. So the case would be the ground. And uh, so this pin, ah, so this pin, which is the ring indicator now is the five volts. So I'm pretty certain that this is what is passing in the, uh, the power here. And uh, you can see this one is zero because that's ground, and this is zero. And so this transmit and uh, uh, receive 
lines are pulled either high or low, so there's some wide range of the uh, possible uh, values. So that is perfectly acceptable at uh, minus 9.5 volts. And we don't have anything else. Okay, so that's uh, what we got here. So basically now we know how the power, uh, at least the 5 volts, is passed in. So now let's uh, just open up this handheld portion of the unit and uh, we can take a look at what is inside. At the back here has some instructions on how to use it, uh, which is very nice that uh, you, know, you don't have to have your manual with you all the time. But uh, I don't expect too much to be in here, so let's just open it up and take a look. So now with all the screws removed, we should be able to open this up and uh, take a peek. <laughs> so the first thing you see is this jumping out at you is this botched component here, and we have a diode and a resistor. Now this kind of botch is quite common on these kind of a low volume production units, as it's going to be very expensive to re-spin the board to accommodate any changes, especially last minute changes or changes found in performance testing. And uh, so it is quite common to see these kind of bodges in this, these kind of uh, small production run units. Anyway, so bodges apart, let's see uh, if we can flip this over and see what we have on the other end. And I managed to open it up and it did take some persuasion as uh, the face of these uh, LCD actually is glued onto the case. So it took a little bit of prying. And unfortunately, in the meantime, that uh, because of the uh, plastic is so brittle and uh, the standoff did break off, but I think that shouldn't be a major problem. We can easily put that back in. And anyway, so uh, the, this is just a keypad connection cable here. So let's uh, put that aside and uh, take a look at this piece. So actually this is a little bit more complex than I originally thought. Uh, I thought it would just be a microcontroller inside, but uh, it, uh, of course, given the vintage of this uh, unit, which you can see here, it's uh, roughly from 91, because that's what the data code said. Uh, the earliest one is 91. Uh, and actually probably it's more like 93 or 94, because some of these data codes, uh, like the one up there you can see here, it's much later. Anyway, so uh, given that uh, the vintage of this board, uh, it's not surprising that they were using a microprocessor here uh, hidden behind this uh, LCD is the AD31. And along with the EEPROM, here's uh, the one-time programmable EEPROM here. And you can see here. So one thing I don't quite like this uh, construction here is that you see that uh, the LCD is actually soldered through these standoff pins onto the main board. So I really couldn't just uh, unplug it and uh, take a peek at what is underneath. But uh, if you see, we do have uh, um, some components. So unfortunately, we're not gonna just, you know, take this off to just see those components here. But nevertheless, that's what the construction is like. And by the way, um, that's pretty much all we have here. And because we have a RS-32 port here, and there is a RS-232 driver, Max-232 here, and as you can see. So now we have uh, seen what is inside that keypad module. Uh, let's shift our attention to this uh, main control unit. And uh, let's flip it over. You can see that from the back, we have uh, three ports here. One is the RS-232, which is con connecting to that uh, keypad module. And we also have a female port, which is also an RS-232. This one goes to your monochromator control, which we don't have the monochromator here. But um, we also have a HPIV, the IEEE488 port, which you can use to hook up to your computer. And uh, so that's pretty much all we have on the outside of this unit. And if we flip over and you can see that uh, the SN here is uh, the serial number is 276. So which means that this is really a low uh, volume produced unit as we suspected earlier. So let's, uh, I think we only have four screws to remove here and we can open it up and see what is inside of this unit. Okay, so all the uh, screws here are loosened and I probably need to flip it over to get the screws out or maybe not. Um, let's see, the screws are out here. Oh yeah, so this opens 
like so. And uh, before I forget, uh, the main purpose of this controller unit is to control the stepper motors inside the monochromator and uh, spectrometer so that we can set the starting wavelength, the stopping wavelength, and the uh, scanning speed. It also can control the width of the input and output slits, so on and so forth. And now we can see the inside of this unit. I did remove all the cables here, and so you can see it a little better. I also removed all these uh, retention uh, nuts so we can take the top board out and uh, take a look at what is underneath this board. So this is, is a little bit more complex than I originally uh, expected. As you can see here, besides an 87C51, uh, which is your AD51 uh, microprocessor here, we do have a Xilinx. FPGA and now this FPGA is XC2064 uh, was a very popular uh, s very small and affordable FPGA back then and it, if I remember correctly it had roughly 1000 gates. Besides this Xilinx FPGA and uh, our 8031 microprocessor uh, we also have this EEPROM in the middle that is supplying the processor the instructions and uh, there's an OKI chip in the middle I don't recognize this chip, but uh, given the proximity between the EEPROM and the microprocessor, presumably is handling some of the logic uh, in between the handshake and whatnot. Towards the left, we can see uh, some 74 series. Actually, there are 74 series all over the place here. And but uh, also an NEC 7210C, which is a GPIB controller chip. Uh, which controls the communication between the GPIB and uh, the peripheral. And also we have this uh, Maximon uh, 232 controlling the uh, serial port communication. And besides that, uh, pretty much that's uh, everything up here. Oh, by the way, uh, we also have a uh, this X24C44, which is a, a static RAM um, chip, and uh, presumably there's another EEPROM, EEPROM chip back here. Uh, probably this one would be, I'm guessing, storing the uh, boot up instructions for your Xilinx. And uh, so the Xilinx probably is uh, programmed by either this header or this header. I'm not sure which one is which, uh, but neither of these are populated here. Now this one says uh, data DS, uh, MSD A, not entirely sure what that means. So that's pretty much everything on the top board. So now let me uh, move this out of the way and we can see what is at uh, the, on the bottom board. And here is the PCB at the bottom. And uh, not surprisingly, there's not too much uh, going on on this board. Uh, one thing interesting is that uh, they have this uh, 115 volts and uh, 240 volts uh, voltage selection switch. Uh, mounted right on the board instead of on the uh, rear panel, which means if you need to switch the voltage for whatever reason, you have to open the unit up and uh, disassemble it to this uh, level and uh, do the switch. And similarly with this uh, fuse uh, mounted right on this board inside uh, this unit, of course if uh, for any whatever reason you need to replace the fuse, uh, you, again you have to do the same exercise. But other than that, uh, you know, no complaints here. And uh, as you can see here, we basically have this rectifier filtering and uh, a regulator right here. And uh, towards the right, we have this uh, what seems to be a programmable array logic uh, little chip here. And not entirely sure what uh, it does on the support. But uh, nevertheless, that's actually everything that's here. And uh, interestingly, we have we do have a connector here. Not not sure. What, where this connector goes to and uh, what it does in this unit. Now, probably, um, I, if I have to guess, it's probably there are some variations to uh, to this controller units and some other, uh, maybe a cable connected to somewhere else, which we don't know. But, uh, and also this header here is not connected either. Now, another interesting thing is we have this two switches here. And one is on this side. This seems to be a momentary switch. Not entirely sure what these two switches are uh, doing here. But uh, they're at the bottom of the uh, the board, so it's not something that you can easily access 
while the everything is assembled. And uh, that's pretty much what I want to cover for, for what is inside this unit. And uh, as mentioned earlier, this one does need a monochromator to be fully functional. So at this point, I don't have anything to hook up. Therefore, I can't really test uh, how this works. But hopefully at some later time, I don't know how long I have to wait to get a, uh, a compatible monochromator in hand and hopefully we can hook it up. But until then, uh, this is uh, all I can uh, show you guys here. Now, given the complexity of the circuitry inside, I won't even be surprised if this unit can also do some sort of a readback. For example, from the sensors located inside the monochromator and the spectrometer, uh, for detecting the uh, mirror locations and limits and uh, stuff like that. But not entirely sure on that. And as usual, if you have more insights into this HS1000 Specs hand scan terminal controller, please leave a comment below. I really hope you have enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up and remember to share and subscribe. I will catch up with you next time.